Well, again, as always, it's a pleasure to be with you all in the Lord's house this evening. And if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Hebrews chapter 12 with me? Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. And tonight we're moving on from Hebrews chapter 11 into uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, but as we've been going through Hebrews 11, we've seen a pattern. Uh, we saw the so-called hall of faith, where many of the uh, saints of the past were mentioned, uh, exactly what they did, how it was that they displayed their faith was put before us. And tonight, as we enter into Hebrews 12, we come to one more example of faith given to us, and that is the faith of Jesus Christ himself. And so if you have your Bibles in Hebrews chapter 12, we'll actually back up to Hebrews 11 in verse 39 together. Hebrews 11, 39. The scripture says, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every faith and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Now let's go to our Lord in a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you again and we thank you for uh, the scripture, the Lord for the faith that Jesus Christ uh, has established for us by his Holy Ghost. And Lord, we pray that you would help us ever to stay in that faith and to grow in that faith. Lord, we pray for those who couldn't make it to worship with us tonight. Lord, that you would grow them also in the same faith, that you would turn their eyes towards Jesus tonight. And uh, Lord, even though I'm not sure if the live stream is uh, going out right now, uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, nonetheless comfort them in their homes and help them to uh, study and worship you there. Lord, we ask that where we've sinned against you, that you would forgive us and that you would keep us until the day of Christ. Uh, be with our missionaries and our representatives. Uh, Lord, be with all of our families. Uh, Lord, those even who may not know your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would send your Holy Ghost to visit them. Lord, send some minister of the gospel to talk to them about Jesus. And if it pleases you, Lord, that you would use us to speak to them about him. Lord, we pray that you would keep us safe until Christ's day. And it's in his name we pray it. Amen. So again, we're right at the end here of the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. And at the end of Hebrews 11, uh, we talked about how all of the uh, saints that went before us, that all of them died without having seen the final fulfillment of the promise in Christ. They did not receive the final promise of Christ. In verse 39, it says, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And we noted that they are waiting for us, that they are, that they are waiting for the day that Christ will finally bring in all of his people and will finally perfect them all. There will not be a single soul that Jesus Christ will save that will be left out before he comes to finish the work that he's began in all of us. Uh, all of the saints, even the Apostle Paul, even uh, Noah and Abraham and Moses that we looked at throughout chapter 11, none of them have been made finally perfect without us because Christ will finally save them all will finally bring us all into that perfection with him together. 
And so when we read in verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What that's talking about is all of the saints that were mentioned before. This great cloud of witnesses are all of those saints that have gone before us. Everyone who has trusted in Jesus Christ from our immediate family who have, who have trusted in Christ and passed on before us all the way back until the first believers, until Adam and his descendants. They all are a great cloud of witnesses around us. And so it, 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 it says here that they, um, that they are looking into things, that, that, they, that they are looking into our affairs. I mean, even the language of, of verse 1 uh, some think that this is, is just talking about how we see their faith in, in chapter 11. I personally think that it's more than that, that we have a kind of spiritual fellowship with them in heaven, that they, they look down to see what's being done in the earth. And that's because in the verse it says that, that we are compassed about, that we are presently surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. It doesn't simply say that they preceded us, that they went before us, or that we just see them in the, in the text here, but that they can pass us around. They have surrounded us. Now, this does not mean, as the Catholics believe, as certain other sects believe, that we ought to pray to these saints, or that they can in some way give us help, or, or something like that, that they're, that they're a means of dispensing grace to us, uh, or, or, or something like that. But rather, it's just simply telling us that it's a comfort to know that all of these saints that have gone before us, who have trusted in the same Savior Jesus Christ as us, that they are waiting for us, that they're interested in what's going on here on the earth, that though they're not omniscient, yet they look down and they see the things that are done on the earth. They, keep, they try to keep tabs on the church down here, And so it says that we are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. Um, another note about that first verse, the word witnesses is the same word that we get our word martyr from. Uh, it's the, it, the, the word martyr means a witness, means someone who bears witness to something. And it talks also in our English about how those who went before us and died in the faith gave their lives for that same faith. And so uh, it's just a comfort to know that we have family in heaven who are looking on our struggles and are interested in our struggles. But nonetheless, our passage goes on to tell us about our own race in the faith, our own struggles in the faith. Those saints that went before us, they had struggles that we read about in chapter 11, but we also have our struggles in the faith. It says, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. It talks about our faith as a race, as an effort that we are going through, that our lives in Jesus Christ are full of effort are full of striving towards a certain goal. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, it says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we and incorruptible. We are running a race. We're putting forth effort. Uh, as, we, as we go through our lives in Jesus Christ, just as the saints in the past did, we will have struggles. We will have difficulty. We will have to put forth our effort. But nonetheless, it's worth it. J just as we saw all through chapter 11, they had struggles. They uh, persevered and they have a promise in the end, the same promise that we have. The same prize that we have uh, in the race. In 1 Corinthians 9.26, I therefore... 
Paul says, I therefore so run, not as uncertain, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. He's, he's putting forth his best effort. He's living the, the, the Christian life, not as uncertain as if he won't make it, not as beating the air, not as doing this in a vain way or with a vain mindset, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So he is talking about his faith. He's talking about his, his fight of faith just and, and, and the struggles that attend his faith, just like the struggles of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah and all that we looked at and Moses and the Israelites. And he says it's a struggle, but he is putting forth his effort towards it. He is, he is persevering in this. And so he also, here in Hebrews, is calling us to put forth that same effort, to press through the hardships of, of the Christian life, to press through the hardships even that our faith will certainly bring upon us. Not to, not to, to, to run as somebody who's wasting their effort, who's beating the air or is uncertain about reaching the goal, but rather to persevere even through the hardships that we will surely endure. He says that in order to run this race, we have to lay aside every weight. That is, we have to lay aside anything that hinders us from running this race. Uh, anything which may become an idol to us, anything which may, which may prevent us. In Matthew 10, 37, it says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It, Jesus himself says that if, your, uh, if you love your family more than you love Jesus Christ, it's a hindrance to you. You are not, you, you, you cannot have Jesus Christ and yet love your family more. You cannot, if, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you will love your family less than you love him. You'll be willing to give up your family, to leave your family if you have faith in Jesus Christ and if that faith demands it, if the family turns on you, if the family will not have you, because of your faith in Christ, then we ought to lay aside that weight. We ought to count as all things as lost for Jesus Christ, to, 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 to love him more than we love them. Uh, this is just, again, keeping with the analogy, just like a runner. Uh, runners today, those who, 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 who perf uh, perform in the Olympics, who, who are racers in the Olympics, uh, they strip down as much weight from their clothing as they can. That they, they, they take as much uh, of the material off their shoes that they can. Uh, that they, they wear the, the, the lightest, thinnest fabric that they can develop, that their teams can develop in order to win the race. They don't want anything dragging them down, hindering them from running that race. And so... Also, we, if we want to run the race of faith, just like Abraham, just like Noah, just like the others, we must lay aside every weight. We must lay aside anything that may become a hindrance to following Jesus Christ and count it as nothing in comparison to him. It also says that we ought to lay aside the sin which besets us. And this is, again, keeping with the analogy of running. Uh, some, some Bibles will say to, to, to uh, lay aside the sin that entangles us or something like that. Um, either way, the idea is that this is getting in our way, that the, that, that the sin is getting in our way of running this race. Um, again, keeping with runners, uh, runners don't typically wear uh, long garments. They don't wear long robes that go down below their knees. In fact, in the scripture, when somebody would go out to run, it'll often talk about them girding up the loins. They, they gird up their loins and they ran. And what that meant 
was that they grabbed the hem of their garment and they pulled it up around their belt. And essentially they made shorts for themselves so that they could run fast, so they could run into the battle. And it's the same with us. If sin would trip us up, if we have sin in our lives that threatens to trip us, that, tr- that, that threatens to keep us from running the race of faith, then we ought to lay it aside. We ought to do everything we can to mortify that sin, to get it out of our way, to, to, to cut off the excesses in our lives so that we can again run the race of faith. 1 Timothy 4.9 says, Do thy diligence to come unto me shortly, Paul says. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Demas here, who's mentioned elsewhere in the scripture as accompanying Paul, he stumbled in the race of faith here. He abandoned his post along with Paul because he loved this present world because he had some sin in this world that lay hold of him, that beset him at a crucial time. And so we see here the last mention of him in the scripture is that he forsakes the apostle Paul, that he loved this present world. There are certain sins, especially for us individually, certain sins that get at us, that get at me particularly, And if we would run the race of faith, we should put those aside. We should do everything we can to avoid those things, to avoid even the temptation towards those things, because it may trip us. It may cause us to stumble. It may hinder us on our way. And finally, we must run with patience, it says, the race that is set before us. Both of the the former items, again, talk about hindrances to running a race either things that are heavy or long garments that might get in the way beset and entangle themselves around us but how he tells us to run in the race is to run with patience is to run the race with patience the race is a long race the race will take us our entire lives to get through and it will not be run by sprinting it will not be run by, by uh, expending all of our energy at the beginning and then being lazy throughout the rest of the race. If we stumble a little bit, we ought not to be discouraged. We ought to pick ourselves up and go on. We ought to race with patience. And this also means that we race with faith. Um, we might ask with all that we've mentioned so far about the race of faith, that, that, that d- doesn't this start, is, is this teaching something that we already rejected earlier in the book of Hebrews? That faith alone is what saves us. Is, is this rejecting that faith uh, alone is, uh, is enough for us to be saved? Faith in Jesus Christ. It, of course, it's not rejecting that. We've seen the theme throughout the whole book of Hebrews that faith alone in Jesus Christ and his work alone is what saves us. Our next verse steers us away from this thinking. Um, In verse 2 it says that we're to do all of this, run the race of faith, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. And in fact, when it says that we should run with patience, the race that is set before us. It's even referring back earlier in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews 6.11 it says, We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That, that Those who through faith and patience. Those are put together. They're the the same thing here in the book of Hebrews. We trust in God to deliver these things to us, and we have patience, therefore, to wait for them. And so it's not denying that we are saved by faith alone. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12, it says that we fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, 
whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. We, we fight the good fight of faith. We run the good race of faith. And it is by that faith in Jesus that we're saved. Jesus, as it says, is the author and finisher of our faith. He has established it by the Holy Ghost. In Romans 8, 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It is by his spirit that we cry, Abba, Father. He works faith in us. It's because the spirit comes to us and he works in our hearts that we even cry out to God in the first place, that we even trust in him in the first place. In Philippians 1.29 it says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's given to us for Christ, because Christ desires it to believe on him. It was our faith, the fact that we trust in God is a gift from God, and it was given to us for the, for the sake of Jesus, because he wanted us to, because he desired for us to trust in him. And so he's the author of our faith. He started it, and the passage says he also will finish it. Again, throughout the whole book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ is central. His work is enough for us in the book of Hebrews. And so if he's the author of our faith, and he's the finisher of our faith, he will see to it, that as we've been reading here, that we do persevere, that he will see to it, that we will, as long as we have trusted in him, as long as we are genuinely his, he will make sure that we will run well the race of faith, that we will not be cast aside, that we will be brought finally to the end, because it's given to us on behalf of Christ to believe on him. He is the author and finisher of our faith. And it's by the same power that he keeps us till the last day. But he's the founder of our faith in another way. He has run this same race before us. Jesus, in fact, is the last, is the last and, and, and the, the, the ultimate example that's given to us in the hall of faith. The hall of faith doesn't end in Hebrews 11, but it continues down into Hebrews 12, where Jesus himself is called the author and finisher of the faith of everyone who's believed on him. And so verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. This is the same pattern as, as Hebrews 11. It, it mentions their name, and it mentions how through faith they did something. And here Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. He demonstrates to us, what faith looks like in his own life. Christ had perfect faith as a man. In Hebrews 5, 6 it says, As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, speaking of Jesus here, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. He was heard in that he feared the Lord. And he cried to the Lord because of his fear of the Lord, because he, because he trusted in the Lord. Christ had faith in the righteousness of the Father first to raise him from the dead, just like it said there in Hebrews 5, when he had, that, that, that when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. He had faith in the Father 
to raise him from the dead. And that the father was righteous to do that. And he also had faith in his own righteousness, in his own ability, that Christ had faith in his own obedience, that he earned that life, that he earned the resurrection of the dead. As a man, Christ had perfect faith in his own self. No one else in the history of mankind has has had any right to have faith in themselves. From Adam even until today, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have failed. And yet Christ was the only one who had the ability, who had the right to have faith in his own efforts, his own self. Christ's hope in himself, in his own obedience, is what drove him to endure the cross. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. It was for the joy of his reward that he endured the cross. It was because of what he looked forward to, because he earned it, because he knew that that was his by his obedience. He had joy set before him, and so he endured the cross. The reward of his act of obedience, that is, he did everything that was required of him, Actively, he went out and did the works that he was supposed to do, was that he was given all authority in heaven and earth. John 3.35, the Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hands. This John spoke even before Jesus went and died on the cross. Jesus had faith in that promise, that the Father gave everything into his hands, all authority and power. And for that joy, he endured the cross. He also had a reward for his passive obedience. That is, when he died on the cross for sinners. When he gave his life for you and me. He won a people for himself. Hebrews 2.12 says, Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him. And again behold I and the children which God hath given me. Christ had faith that because of his passive obedience, dying on the cross, he would win us to himself. He would win the church to himself, that he might present it a a beautiful church, a spotless church, having neither spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Christ died on the cross in his passive obedience and had faith that by that he would win us for himself. He won the church. And for this joy, he endured the cross. And so Christ's hope was rewarded. In verse 2 it says, And he is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It was given to him at the very end. He is at the very pinnacle of the great cloud of witnesses. In in what Jesus did, the fact that he died on the cross for us, the the, the, the fact that he endured such sufferings, and having hope, in the joy that was set before him in it, we see that he had faith. We see that he had faith that the Father was not unrighteous, but that he would give him what was due to him. All authority and a people unto himself. And so Jesus Christ is the pinnacle of the hall of faith. The greatest example of faith that we have, because he had faith in his own work. And so, believers, tonight, Christ's hope, Christ's faith here, is an example to us of perseverance. In verse 3 it says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. The faith which Christ had in himself is our example. That we should also look to him. This isn't, uh, this isn't a pep talk about how we should trust in ourselves. Don't, don't misunderstand me here. But rather, if Christ's faith, as the pinnacle of all faith, was in Jesus Christ, our faith should also be in Jesus Christ. It should also be exclusively in Him. And so let's consider. Let's consider Him. When we have struggles in our walk, when we have adversity 
that's brought against us, when the enemies of God rail against us, let's consider Jesus Christ, who endured contradiction of sinners against himself, who endured when he was tempted and did not sin, who had all faith in the promises that that were made to him in the covenant of redemption. And so he endured the cross, despising the shame. He did not care about the momentary shame, but rather he looked forward to the joy that was set before him. And likewise, let's consider Jesus Christ and have faith in him. When we feel like fainting, When we feel like being faithless, let's look to Christ's faith for strength. And now if there's an unbeliever here tonight, Christ trusted in himself. Christ did not entrust the salvation of sinners to anyone else. It was too important a task. It was a task that no one else could accomplish except for Jesus Christ. And so he trusted it only to himself, only to his accomplishment on the cross. Do not think that you will be saved because you go to church. Don't think that you will be saved because you do good deeds sometimes. But only have any confidence if you trust in Jesus Christ. Come to Jesus Christ tonight. If you have not, then you do not have salvation. Consider him who, had, who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, who, it, who, who trusted salvation to no one else, but endured those sufferings, but endured that shame, who considered it as nothing for the joy that was set before him, and then lament and weep that you thought that you could earn that salvation yourself that you could live up to God's holy standards and run to Jesus Christ. Trust only in him. Acts 4 verse 10 says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this, this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Do not trust yourself, but trust in Jesus Christ. Come to him and be saved. And again, believers, as we go out and we attempt to live the life of faith, let's consider ultimately Jesus Christ his faith in his own self, his confidence in his ability to save us. And let's run the race with patience in that, always trusting that he will persevere us to the end. He will see us through who have trusted in him. And let's go to our Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you again and we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the faith of Jesus. And we just pray that you would Help us always to consider his sufferings for us. Lord, his confidence, Lord, that drove him to the cross that he could save sinners like us. Lord, we pray that you would help us also to have confidence in that same gospel that saved us. Lord, that you would help us to entrust our friends and family to the gospel. Lord, that you would help us to preach it to them. Lord, to apply it to their lives as often as we're able. And Lord, to be a good example of, uh, of faith in Jesus Christ. Be with those who could make it to worship with us tonight. We pray you would keep them safe and bring them back. Lord, be with our missionaries and our representatives. Lord, be with the pastors and the uh, laity in our area. Lord, just be with all of the churches. Lord, help them to know what they ought to do. Lord, to preach the gospel and be faithful about doing that. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, bring forth much fruit by them. It's in Christ's holy name we pray.